This episode is brought to you by Rune. Rune 1.8 is an immersive new music experience featuring a new look, new intelligence, and new features designed for music fanatics. Click the link in the description box below for more information. Five days ago, we published a video about the Q Acoustics Concept 30, this little pint-sized stand mount loudspeaker. And we also had the Q Acoustics 10 security stands in there, which are like a, a nice sort of very minimal looking quadruped kind of stand. I love the look of these speakers and their stands. I think it's very modern, very cool. And I think it's an excellent choice for small rooms, the speaker in general really is. And that video did pretty well. Now, after five days, it's reached just over 40,000 people. Not amazing, but not terrible either. It's pretty good. And we got, how many comments did we get? Because I did write this down, 165 comments. So thank you for those. And I've picked a few of my favorites here to kind of go through them, tease out some extra points, some extra thoughts about the Concept 30. Now you will remember, if you've watched this video, that I likened loudspeakers to ice cream. You choose your flavor. So our first comment comes from Martin Bishop, and he writes, my favorite ice cream is mint choc chip. So basically I put all the comments inside a Google Doc, the comments I want to talk about. And then a, a user that goes by the name of Dash Dot, ultimately minimal, I guess, really. He writes, as long as it's good, almost any flavor except bubblegum and mint choc chip. See what I mean? Like, it's just, you have to pick the flavor that you like the most. And then a user called I Won't Tell You writes, you're wrong, it's salted caramel. And then it goes further because a chap called Larry Siderman writes a bit more eloquently, I think. There is one ice cream flavor that stands above all the others in terms of popularity. And that is vanilla. So it is possible that one of these speakers is more vanilla than the other two. And from your descriptions, that would seem to be the Q Acoustics. Absolutely dead right. Yeah, the Q Acoustics is the kind of the more vanilla flavored. Salted caramel, that's the Sonus Faber. So Good Sound wrote, this is quite a long comment. The recommendation to get rather a subwoofer paired with stand mounts instead of floor standards makes me go, hmm. Because when you try different brands work together properly, there is the problem of different efficiency SPL of the two products across different volumes. The subwoofer is either too low in volume or too loud and rarely just right. It would need a DSP to constantly even out the different response curves. Therefore, with my experience, it's very difficult to make different brands work together satisfyingly. Well, I don't know whether I agree with that. I mean, I've never had an experience where the subwoofer is too quiet or too loud. I mean, that's what the gain on the back of the sub is for, right? I mean, certainly with the KEF KC62 that I used in that Q Acoustics video, there's a gain setting. I have no problem matching the gain of that subwoofer to the gain gain applied by the amp, the external amp to the loudspeakers, none whatsoever. And it's the same with the SVS 3000 micro subwoofer. That's got a gain on the back. It's got loads of DSP inside. In fact, that allows me to tailor the sound even more to my liking and to my room than floor standards. You can do things with that sub that floor standards can only dream of, right? Especially I'm talking passive floor standards here, right? It's just, just worlds away. So I'm sorry, good sound. I my experience doesn't agree with yours. I'm not saying you're wrong. Maybe you've tried different gear that doesn't pair well together. But I know that Q Acoustics make a subwoofer. So if you're really worried about that, Q Acoustic speakers, Q Acoustic sub, and then hit up their technical support if you get stuck. Next comment comes from Bob B. He writes, of the three pairs, the Q with a quick sub would be the only choice for this listener. After some painful rabbit holes, both sonically and financially, 
I have learned what type of sound I prefer. Important to know when assessing speakers or system sound in general. Great review, John. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, Bob makes a good point here, and the reason I'm pulling this one out is because, yeah, it's important to know what flavour of ice cream you like, and if you don't know what flavour of ice cream you like, you've got to try a bunch. Now, I realise it's much cheaper and easier than sort of trying a bunch of hi-fi gear, but it's the same process. Try some stuff, listen for yourself, try and work out what kinds of flavours you like what kinds of sonic flavors from different loudspeaker manufacturers or different amplifier manufacturers that you like. Amp flavors don't vary as much as, or anywhere near as much as speaker flavors. But then again, room flavors vary the most. So you have to factor in the room when picking the speaker that you think you like. I mean, yeah, you can choose the flavor. You might like a really big floor stander, but if that flavor of loudspeaker doesn't fit with your room, you're wasting your money and your time. But yeah, the process, I think, of being an audiophile or being somebody who's into high quality sound is finding out what kinds of sounds you like because they come in many different flavors. And I know Steve Gutenberg has spoken about this many times, right? He said that if there is sort of one ideal sound, you would think that really expensive loudspeakers where build budgets are, well, I won't say they're completely irrelevant, but almost irrelevant. You would think that high-end loudspeakers would all kind of converge into one sort of standard sound or one sort of homogenous sound because they're all moving towards one ideal. But if you go and listen to a whole bunch of different loudspeakers that sell for 100K or 200K, this is only at shows, nothing could be further from the truth. They all sound wildly different. All right, moving on. This is to the, the gel core aspect of the Q Acoustics loudspeaker, the layer of gel that sits between the two, I would assume, MDF layers that make up the cabinet of the Concept 30. And I said I wasn't aware of any other loudspeaker manufacturer that did that. Now, Irene Sirius corrects me. He says, or she says, QLN speakers in Gothenburg, Sweden, have used a similar technique as the gel core since the mid 70s. And then Hubert writes, gel cores on window glass absolutely blocks sound incredibly well. So I'm a believer in this technology. Great for keeping unwanted sound out of your space. So yeah, there's another great example of where gel core is used. In fact, I think the windows in my building have a gel core layer between sort of two panes of safety glass that I, th I think it expands and contracts with, with temperature, actually. But it definitely does block a lot of the sound. I know when I close my windows up here, like the, the noise floor of this room is super low. It's fantastic. But right now, the window is open. And I can hear a faint humming of an AC unit, maybe in, in the courtyard below, but that's about it. So it's still pretty good, even with the windows open. Oh yeah, but we're talking about my room. Okay, so there seems to be some confusion about whether this room is, well, basically small or not. It measures six meters by five meters. I used to call it the sort of smaller end of medium. The reason I've started calling it small again is because of my friend, acoustics expert, Yesko Lohan. He says, look, anything from an acoustic point of view that's smaller than a typical classroom is a small room. So if your room is two meters by three meters, or one by two, or God forbid two by two, because square rooms are a bit of a nightmare acoustically, then it's still a small room. Maybe it's a very small room. I don't know, I don't know how you classify these things, but don't get too hung up on whether I refer to this room as a small room or a medium sized room, because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. The dimensions matter, right? So if you're trying to kind of connect with what I'm doing and your room is smaller, then like, for example, the Q Acoustics loudspeakers and the Sonus Fabers, great speakers for a very small room. So if it's like three meters by four, or I don't know, even like, to say it's two and a half by six, even a corridor type room. Q Acoustics will be more than enough, and maybe you add a sub, maybe, if you want to. So that's, that's why I cover so many stand mounts, is because they're great for rooms like this one, but also rooms smaller than this one. So Cheeky Fest writes, Six meters by five meters equals smallish room. 
And Nemanja Sarek writes, a smallish room of six meters by five meters. Ooh, average living rooms in Germany are really big, smiley face. All right, moving on. So I am Doris writes, what's the deal with these ad breaks in your videos? Do they show where an ad would be if you would not have been supported by your Patreons? Just curious. I'm tackling this because I've seen a few questions about this. No, nothing to do with Patreon. This is nothing to do with Patreon. It's basically a third of you are on YouTube premium, two thirds are not. So I don't want your experience to be the frustrating experience that I have when I'm watching YouTube on my TV in that sort of mid-roll ads, so the ads that appear in the middle of a video just sort of burst out of nowhere. You get a little countdown in the bottom right corner, but they come out of nowhere and usually they're not spliced in in a nicely convenient place. Usually they cut off the end of a word or the beginning of another scene of the video. So I put those ad break segments in so I can cut those ads in. Now, if you're on YouTube Premium, you'll just see my ad break animation and nothing else. Or if especially at the start of a video's life cycle, if ad buyers on Google side have yet to kind of purchase that spot, it'll be empty and nothing will go in that space, but eventually it will. So eventually you'll see like my little animation for ad break, then a proper Google ad, and then it'll come out of that. So basically what I'm trying to do is improve your viewing experience for the majority of you. I'm sorry for the YouTube premium people that uh, have to put up with that, but I mean, yeah, we all have to sort of put up with things at times. And yeah, I just thought I would serve the majority rather than the minority. Okay, last comment goes to budget audiophile lifelong. Now I've got to give this guy a shout out because he comments nicely about a lot of my videos. He's always leaving a comment, always constructive, always positive, you know, and I'm not saying that just because I want positive comments, but you know, obviously my channel is resonating with this guy and many other people, so I'm, I'm kind of giving him a shout out here, budget audio file lifelong, but also I, I want to read his comment because he writes, thanks John, we like this video and the comparisons, but it seems like you had a double espresso in this video, smiley face. Again, we're going to try your music suggestions. Um, double espresso, no, because at the start of this year, shock horror, I gave up caffeine. I, originally I gave it up for a month, but I began sleeping so well that I just continued. So all my coffee now is decaf. So some of you purists will be outraged by this. <laughs> well, screw you, because I, I sleep better. And, and really, it has improved my mood during the day. And I guess in some ways it has changed the way I see the world and it changed the way I kind of look at my job. And it's probably why that I've started doing, I mean, this is a tenuous connection, but it could be why I've started making these comments videos that respond to some of your questions or observations or whatever. So I hope you dig these kinds of videos. If you did, give us a like down below. If you like my decaffeinated attitude to hi-fi, then please consider subscribing to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. WYSIWYG.